Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, hello everyone, it's a pleasure today uh, to have Yuval Bahat to talk about his uh, recent work on Explorer Super Resolution, who was presented at CDPR uh, as an oral. Yuval is a postdoctoral researcher at the Technion, where he works with Professor Tomer Michele, and his research focuses on the intersection of computer vision and audio processing and machine learning. He did his PhD at the Weizmann Institute uh, of Science, uh, working with Professor Michal Irani, uh, focusing on image hazing and the blurring, as well as image classification. And previously, he completed his master's and bachelor at the Technion, advised by Professor Jörg Schneckner. Uh, uh, welcome. And Thank you very much. To hear. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Javier. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this work uh, I did with Professor Tomer Michaeli at the Technion uh, during uh, my postdoc. And this work is about super resolution, which is uh, the problem where we get this uh, low resolution image and we want to obtain a super resolved version, super resolved version of it, but not by uh, repeating the pixels. Um, and in the real world, we know that there are infinitely many different high resolution images that could have led to this low resolution image, meaning each of these images when downsampled match the input uh, and there are, uh, there are abundant uh, different high resolution images and they can be very different from one another. For example, if we zoom in, we can see that the differences can be even uh, very uh, uh, significant semantically. Um, however, existing super resolution methods like EDSR uh, do, I mean, they are able to produce uh, higher resolution outputs, but they only output a single solution, a single high resolution image. Even images that are trained using the GAN framework like ESR GAN uh, is able to uh, produce an image which is uh, more photorealistic. It looks, um, it looks better, but still it's only, it is only one solution. Uh, and this is problematic in several aspects that I want to um, briefly survey. So for example, let's say we have this low resolution image uh, here and we feed it to ESR GAN and we get this uh, much nicer looking result. Um, but then we want to ask, for example, is the animal in the image definitely a horse? And we cannot answer this question um, using ESR GAN. Or perhaps I took this image and I know that it should be a zebra, but I, I have no way of accommodating this prior knowledge to the output. I have a single output and that's it. Uh, moving to an example from the uh, domain of forensics, let's say we have this image, this low resolution image of a suspicious car and we are interested in the number on, on its license plate. So we can once again feed it to ESR GAN and we can see the result which looks much nicer then we can zoom in to the license plate, but we have no way of saying, for example, uh, looking at this central digit, can this digit be a zero? How about a seven? We have no way of uh, evaluating the likelihood of any of the options, for example, for the central digits. Um, another, the last example I will uh, talk about here is uh, from the medical domain. Let's say we have this low resolution uh, X-ray of, of the area of the shoulder, and we are interested in a, in a specific pathology that appears uh, in the red area. Uh, and this pathology is uh, characterized by the distance between these two bones, um, which is between these two bones, which is uh, smaller than seven millimeters. If it is smaller than seven millimeters, then we can say that the pathology exists. So we can uh, use ESR GAN to, um, to super resolve the image. Uh, and then we can see that the distance is eight millimeters, but we cannot say whether this is the only option. Um, how likely is it? We cannot answer the question. How likely is it that perhaps the distance is indeed below seven millimeters? So we know this is one possible solution, but perhaps there are other uh, possible solutions that do indicate pathology and using existing methods, we cannot answer these questions. So to tackle these problems that I just talked about, we propose a new task, which we call uh, explorable super resolution. Uh, and we aim to enable the user to explore the infinite possible high resolution solutions that correspond to the input image. And in the rest of this talk, I'm going to first tell you about the framework that we propose to solve uh, this uh, new task. 
Then I'm going to tell you about a specific component of this framework, uh, which we call the consistency enforcing module. Then I'm, go I'm going to have a very small detour, tell you about uh, a couple of uh, additional benefits of this CEM, the uh, consistency enforcing module, that go beyond the context of explorable super resolution. And then I'm going to tell you about uh, how we train our model. And finally, I'm going to demonstrate some exploration use cases uh, and uh, show you some exploration tools that we uh, devised. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the framework. We have the low resolution input, we have the super resolution network, uh, and we have the output. And the first main uh, component or main uh, modification that we propose is to incorporate some kind of a user input signal. Uh, where a user can uh, look at the, at the output and then change or manipulate the signal to manipulate the output. And then the user can interact with the system and explore the different solutions. And we want all outputs of our network to have uh, two specific, very important properties. The first one is we want all outputs to be perceptually plausible. We want them to look like natural images. And for this, we uh, train our network with a GAN framework that is known to yield uh, percept higher perceptual quality. The second very important property is that we want all outputs of our network to be consistent with the low resolution input. What do I mean by consistent? I mean that when we downsample the output of our network, it would precisely match the input image. Um, <clears throat> Now, unfortunately, existing super resolution methods do not guarantee this consistency. The output of existing super resolution methods is generally inconsistent. And the reason for this has to do with the way these uh, networks are trained. So they're usually trained by um, taking a data, a data set of uh, high resolution ground truth images and then producing their low resolution uh, counterparts by downsampling them. This is done by convolving them with a downsampling kernel, some default downsampling kernel H, for example, the bicubic kernel, and then downsampling them by factor of alpha, which is the super resolution factor. Then the training of the network is done by minimizing uh, this uh, penalty, this uh, loss function, uh, minimizing, minimizing the difference between the output of the network and the corresponding ground truth image. However, there are two issues with this uh, penalty. First, that it penalizes for the difference in the high resolution domain. And, um, and the consistency that we are after is actually computed in the low resolution domain. But more importantly, this penalty is minimized during training. And there is no guarantee that during test time when we get a new unseen image, uh, it would be zero. There is no guarantee that the image, that the output would be consistent at test time. So uh, we have this inconsistent output of the image, of the, uh, sorry, of the network, and we propose to, um, uh, to incorporate some kind of a consistency enforcing module whose output would be consistent. And we do it by projecting the output, the inconsistent output of the network onto the set of images that are consistent with the input, which is an affine subspace uh, defined by the downstempling kernel H. And we can formulate this uh, requirement as an optimization problem where we want the consistent output x hat to be as close as possible to the inconsistent output of the network while being perfectly consistent with the input y. And it turns out that this uh, optimization problem has a closed form solution, which we can uh, uh, write in terms of uh, basic operations like convolutions, upsampling, and downsampling. And this solution can be very easily translated into an architectural module uh, using the framework of, of your choice, for example, PyTorch or TensorFlow. And this is what we did. We built this architectural module, which we call the consistency enforcing module, the CEM, um, which, is a direct, uh, which is directly devised by, uh, derived from the solution of the optimization problem. Uh, I do want to give you some intuition uh, about how it works. So we can divide it into two main components. The lower branch here uh, performs something like an interpolation. It takes the low resolution image and interpolates it to determine the low frequency content of the output. 
The higher branch here performs something which is similar to high pass filtering of the output of the network. So the high frequencies, the high frequency content of our output uh, is determined uh, by this high pass filtering branch. Uh, and the building blocks for this uh, module are the upsampling and downsampling operations here in circles and the uh, convolution with preset filters in yellow rectangles. And these filters, uh, we have H, which is the assumed downsampling kernel, for example, the default by cubic one or any other kernel. And we have uh, other filters which are computed using a closed form expression of H. So there is no training involved. Um, <clears throat> so now we have uh, this consistency enforcing module in our framework. And when we perform exploration, we know that we are guaranteed that all our, mod our model outputs uh, match, exactly match the uh, input low resolution image. So we can perform exploration knowing that. Okay, so so far I told you about uh, the framework and I told you about the consistency enforcing module, the CEM, and I want to make this small detour to tell you about uh, two additional benefits of using the CEM. We can use it to wrap any existing super resolution uh, network, even pre-trained networks. And the first benefit is that it is guaranteed that it can only improve uh, the PSNR. It can only reduce the reconstruction error. And to validate this, uh, uh, this benefit, we, did, we performed the following experiment. We took EDSR, a pre-trained um, EDSR model, super resolution method, uh, in three different uh, super resolution factors, two, three, and four. And we measured the PSNR, the average PSNR over the BSD100 uh, data set. And then we took our CM and used it to wrap the output of EDSR. And you can see that it yields some improvement in PSNR. It is not necessarily significant. I, I think in this case, it's not significant. But the main thing here is that it is guaranteed that it can only reduce, it cannot harm because of this consistency. The second benefit, which I think is a bit more um, valuable, has to do with super resolution over real images, super resolution in the real world. Uh, and recall that, uh, so that these networks are trained using, uh, by uh, creating this uh, data set of uh, pairs of high resolution and low resolution images using the default bicubic kernel. And by doing this, the network learns to handle images which were, which were downsampled using this specific kernel. However, this is not necessarily uh, the realistic kernel. This, this kernel does not necessarily uh, correspond to real low resolution images. In fact, it, it rarely does because usually the downsampling kernel is wider. Um, and then when we use the network trained on the default kernel uh, to super resolve uh, an image which, is, which was downsampled using a different kernel, the result is inconsistent, not only because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, but also because the network didn't uh, learn to handle these kind of images, these kind of kernels. So what should we do? Should we just throw away uh, this network that we trained for so long? Um, so this is where we can use our CEM to wrap um, the output of the network. And recall that the CM has these five convolution operations uh, with uh, filters that are det determined by the, down the assumed downsampling kernel H. So we can now use the actual downsampling, da downsampling kernel corresponding to the input image and recompute these five filters. And then the output of our CM is guaranteed to once, ab once again be consistent with the input given this, um, this correct kernel. Now, in reality, we usually don't have access to the correct kernel, so we can use some kernel estimation algorithm. And we did this to, to demonstrate this benefit. Uh, I took this image, this low resolution image, uh, we fed it to uh, ESRGAN, and this is the result of ESRGAN. And ESRGAN was trained using the BiQB kernel. So you can see uh, the super resolved uh, version. And then we took the kernel estimation method by Bert uh, Ligler et al. called kernel gun, and we used it to estimate the actual uh, kernel corresponding to the input image. And then we recomputed the filters in our CM and wrapped ESR, the output of ESR gun with our CM, and this is the result. And you can see the result is sharper, and we can even zoom in uh, just to better see the, the differences between the middle and right images. So 
An important benefit of, of this CM is that it enables us to adapt pre-trained network to the image-specific downsampling kernels. Uh, and this way we can use it on real world uh, low resolution images. So let's go back to uh, our explorable super resolution um, context. And let me tell you how we train our model. And I'll start by telling you how classical super resolution methods are trained. So we have this um, um, input image, the network and the output image. And we have the data set of uh, high resolution, ground truth high resolution images. So all super resolution methods use uh, some loss term, which we call the full reference loss term. And they penalize for the difference between the output of the net their network and the ground truth image corresponding to the output. And they penalize, they can, they can do it either, uh, they can penalize for the L1 distance or L2 distance, or they can use what's known as the perceptual distance, meaning the distance in the feature space of a classification network like VTG. Uh, a second loss term, which is used by uh, GAN, GAN methods, uh, uses a discriminator that is trained to distinguish between the distribution of real images and the distribution of images produced by our network or by the network. And, and this way, this discriminator is used to uh, incorporate another uh, loss term, uh, which is called the adversarial loss term. But in this work, we ask how suitable is the full reference loss term, the first one I mentioned, for explorable super resolution. And the, our answer for this is that it is not really suitable because this uh, loss term like L1 or L2 is known to produce overly smooth images, which is not what we want. We want to have photorealistic uh, outputs. And um, it is known to decrease diversity because we force the output of our network to look like a specific ground truth image while as I told you in the beginning of this talk, there are infinitely many possible high resolution images. And when we perform explorable super resolution, we want to enable uh, this diversity. So this is something that we, that we don't know, that we don't uh, want. Luckily, we have this CM, this consistency enforcing module that already limits the output of our network to be close or related to the input. And this allows us to discard this uh, full reference loss term altogether. So we don't use any full reference loss term and we can uh, use only the adversarial loss term. Um, the second thing we need is we have this uh, control input signal, right? We want the user to be able to manipulate uh, the output of our image, the, sorry, the output of our uh, method. And we do that by injecting the control signal, which we denote by Z. Uh, and we inject Z to each layer of our network to promote faster training. Now, Z is a three-dimensional signal, and it has uh, special uh, dimensions that correspond to the dimensions of the output image. And this allows us to perform local editing of the image. If you want to only edit a specific region of the image, we would only change, we would only manipulate this part of Z that corresponds to this area. And then it has uh, C channels. And in this implementation, we use three channels. And I will tell you in a second why did we choose three. So a test time or exploration time, if, if you want. Um, editing is, is uh, performed by using a graphical user interface. So we devise this graphical user interface that comprises several tools uh, that allow this editing. However, a training time, we need to have some mechanism to encourage the effect of Z of the control signal on the network. We don't want the network to ignore the control signal. Uh, and we use two different mechanisms to encourage this effect. The first one uh, encourages the ability to intuitively uh, edit the output. And we do that by linking the, uh, the Z, the, the control signal, to special image derivatives. How do we do that? We randomly sample um, Z but uh, we, run, we do it uh, uniformly. So uh, each signal Z has three numbers, uh, spatially uniform. So we have three channels, which are um, uh, only three different numbers. Um, and then we compute the structure tensor of the output. By this, I mean we compute the special derivatives and we build the, special, the structure tensor, which is uh, comprised from the uh, special derivatives of the entire image. This is a two by two matrix 
a symmetric matrix, which means it has three degrees of freedom. And this is why we chose three channels, because what we do next is we uh, compute a corresponding desired structure tensor from these three numbers that we randomly sampled of Z. And then we can add to the adversarial loss term an additional loss term that penalizes for the difference between the desired structure tensor and the structure tensor measured uh, on our output. And we denote this uh, additional loss term by L struct. Struct stands for a structure tensor. The second mechanism um, we use to encourage the effect of Z uh, works differently. <clears throat> and we call it we, that our goal is to traverse, to be able to traverse the, this manifold of natural images, natural high resolution images that correspond to the input image using the control signal Z. Um, so to allow this mapping between the space of uh, signal Z and the manifold of natural images, uh, we want to uh, make sure that each ground truth high resolution image in, in our data set is obtainable using some Z, using some control signal Z. How do we do that? How do we make sure that uh, each ground truth image is obtainable using some Z? We uh, look at the difference between the output of our network and the corresponding ground truth image. Now we do not penalize for this difference because this, this would be the uh, full reference loss that I just told you that we want to avoid. Instead, we minimize this distance over the space of Z. So we look for the uh, control signal Z that minimizes this distance. We do this by uh, performing 10 um, minimization iterations. And then once we found the image, which is the closest possible to the ground truth, we penalize for this distance with a loss term, which we denote by L map, where map stands for mapping. Mapping between Z and the, the um, manifold of natural images. So uh, I told you about uh, the training of our model. And now let's, uh, let me tell you how we use our framework for exploration. Um, so we have this uh, graphical user interface, the GUI that I uh, mentioned earlier. And we have two principal editing modes. The first one is the one that allows intuitive editing by manipulating, by manually changing Z, the control signal, to manipulate, to directly manipulate the special image derivatives. <clears throat> the second mode of editing uh, allows for more intricate editing operations by performing, by um, pressing each of the buttons here in red, uh, which triggers an optimization process over Z to optimize for some objective. So for some objective functions, and I will mention several objective functions uh, in a second to give you a sense of this. So let's start with the first uh, editing mode, the one that allows for a direct manipulation of uh, special derivatives. So we have this input image, and this is the output of our network before we perform any editing. This is, you can say, the neutral output. And now let's say we want to edit the fur, the areas of fur on this mandrill's cheeks. Uh, so we mark the uh, regions that we want to edit. And then we directly manipulate the directional special derivatives. For example, we can have weaker textures by having weaker special derivatives, or we can have stronger ones. Or maybe we want to have um, horizontal textures by increasing the vertical special derivatives, or vi vice versa. Perhaps we want to have uh, vertical textures. All of these images that I just showed you are guaranteed to precisely match the input when downsampled because of our CEM. And let me now show you a short uh, video clip of how this is actually done in practice using our GUI. So this is our GUI and this is the editing, edited image in, on the right. Uh, and we start by selecting the region that we want to edit. Here I'm only demonstrating the editing of the right cheek. And then we can change, we can turn this dial to change the direction of the texture. This is all done in real time. <clears throat> then we can increase the magnitude of the derivatives by moving this slider or decrease it. We can decrease the magnitude in both directions to have weaker textures. And then we can undo our editing operations to watch uh, the different versions that we were able to, to produce.
Okay. So uh, I mentioned that there are two principal modes of operation. So let me tell you about the second one that allows for more intricate editing operations. And to demonstrate it, I will use several examples. I will start with this image of Barbara, this low resolution image. And uh, first I'll show you the output of our network. This is the unedited output. And let's say we have um, prior user knowledge. We know that uh, the clothes worn by Barbara should have stripes on them. And we all know that the map, the table map, or I think the table map should have um, a different appearance. It should look less messy. So we want to incorporate this prior knowledge uh, onto our output image. And we use several tools for that. We start with a tool that um, manipulates the local variance of pixels in the image. So for example, here we want to decrease the local variance in the area marked in cyan to have a less messy appearance of the map. And we want to increase the variance, local variance in the red areas to have some textures on the cloth uh, of Barbara. So um, this is uh, the before image. I'm sorry, maybe before that you didn't see the, <laughs> the cyan and red marking. So I, I'll repeat that. So we have the cyan area, which we want to have a, a weaker textures because we want to have a weaker, uh, less messy appearance of the map. And we have the red areas where we want to increase uh, the local variance to have some texture on the cloth. So uh, this is the bef this is uh, the result of uh, of pressing this um, button of increasing and decreasing the variance. And let me flicker between them to show you the difference. This is before we perform this optimization that manipulates the variance, and this is after. And you can see that we are able to. Uh, on the map, we are able to uh, make it look less messy. This is before and this is after. And we are able to get some texture on uh, Barbara's pants and clothes, uh, although this is still not the stripes that we are looking for. So the next tool we would use to, uh, to, have a, to get a more aligned look of the stripes is what we call uh, the period periodicity tool. It's a tool that encourages periodic patterns. And we want to encourage periodic patterns of uh, period length 4.4 pixels in this case. Um, so this is the before, and this is what we get after we apply this tool. And let me once again flicker between them. This is before, and this is how we. In, this is after we encourage the uh, periodicity of this area. The last tool I'm going to use on this image is something that would uh, propagate this. Uh, appearance of stripes from certain regions in the on her clothes to her entire uh, garment, and we do that using a tool that uh, propagates patches from a source area to a target area. So we want to propagate patches from this yellow blob here to the entire uh, left leg of Barbara, and uh, we want to propagate patches from this uh, left uh, yellow blob to the entire right leg and to her head cover as well. So this is before, and this is after we propagate patches. Um, and once again, this is before, and this is after. So you can see that um, I'm going back to the, uh, to the unedited result because I want to show you the before and after the entire editing process. So this is what we got, this is what we had before we performed editing. And this is the result we were able to obtain. Finally, we were able to regain the stripes on her Cloth and get a better appearance or a more, I think, realistic appearance of the map. Um, a second set of tools, of optimization tools uh, that our GUI uh, comprises, allows for graphical user input. For example, if we have this low resolution image that I showed you before, um, we feed it to our network, and this is the pre edited result of our network. And now um, we can use, a, for example, the scribbling tools. So we can apply these scribbles on uh, the animal and we can try to embed them. And we would do this, we would do this in a way that is uh, consistent uh, and plausible. So we perform Z optimization to find the image that is both consistent and plausible and closest to this. Uh, uh, now note that we had this, uh, a couple of black stripes and a couple of red stripes. And the image that we found only has black stripes. And this is because 
uh, the output is guaranteed to be consistent with the input, and red stripes in no way could be consistent with the input. Uh, another set, another tool uh, that is part of this uh, uh, set of tools to allow graphical user input is the imprinting tool. For example, uh, let's go back to the use case where we know that the image, that the animal in the image should be a zebra. So we can find, for example, an image on the internet of a zebra, and then we can mark a region on the zebra's body, and we can try to imprint it onto the output of our network. And this is what we get. This is the result we get uh, after performing the optimization over the Z space, the space of Z. Um, so by this, we are able to regain the uh, zebra appearance if we know that it should be a zebra, in fact. And there are, any, uh, there are other variants of this, uh, of this set of tools for graphical user input. We can uh, allow brightness manipulation and we can uh, encourage uh, local or piecewise smoothness by performing local uh, total variations minimization. Uh, you can find more details in the paper about these variants. So finally, by uh, using our framework, you can take this low resolution input and we can make it look like a gray horse if we know it's a horse. Or we can also make it look like a young zebra. And both of these images uh, are guaranteed to precisely match the low resolution input when downsampled. Uh, similar example uh, that I'll show you is using this low resolution deer. And we can explore the different uh, high resolution images that correspond to it. And it can, uh, for example, be a spotless deer, or it can correspond to a different species of a spotted deer. Let's go back to the uh, forensic use case that I uh, mentioned in the beginning. So we have this suspicious scar, and we are interested in the number on its license plate. Uh, so we can feed it to our super resolution network. This is the result. Once again, it doesn't give us a lot of information. We want to, uh, to find out what uh, digits can this central digit correspond to. Can it be a zero? Can it be a seven? And we can do this. We can explore uh, the different options by attempting to imprint different digits. For example, we can attempt to imprint zero onto the uh, central digit, and this is what we get. Or we can attempt to imprint one, and we would get this after performing optimization over Z, two, and so on and so forth with all possible 10 digits. And now if we look closely at the, at the outputs, at the corresponding outputs, we would notice that only one zero and eight look plausible. The other digits, the other outputs, have many artifacts in them. And this suggests that it is most likely that the, this central digit is either zero, one, and eight, and it is less likely that it is one of the other digits. Uh, uh, going back to the medical use case, where we have this uh, low resolution x-ray, and we have uh, the output of our network, the pre-edited output, and we are interested to know, could there be a supraspinatus tendon tear? That's the specific pathology that we are after in this x-ray. So uh, we're looking at this uh, specific area of the shoulder. We zoom in and we measure the distance between these two bones, uh, which is called the uh, acromiohumeral distance. Here it is in this unedited result, this arbitrary solution, if you may, it is eight millimeters. And we know that the pathology is indicated when this distance is lower than seven millimeters. So we want to ask, uh, could it be lower than seven millimeters? And we answer this question by attempting to imprint the upper bone onto a lower location. So we, we imprint it onto a lower location and we get a distance on sev of seven millimeters, but uh, we want to ask whether it can be lower than seven millimeters. So we repeat this step. We once again imprint it onto a lower location, and we get a distance of six millimeters. However, now if we look closer at the output that corresponds to the pathology that corresponds to six millimeters, we can see that we have artifacts, meaning it is no longer plausible. And this can help us uh, deduce that the supraspinatus tendon tier, this pathology, is less likely in this low resolution image. Another use case uh, for our uh, framework is where we, when we want to correct for problematic super resolution outputs. For example, we have this low resolution input uh, and we feed it to ESRGAN and this is what we get. Not, now note that although ESRGAN is a state of the art 
in terms of uh, perceptual quality, uh, it does not always succeed like any other method. And you can see that the appearance of the building doesn't look good and the rope, this uh, string that uh, the woman is walking on disappears in the middle. So it doesn't look very good. So then we can use our framework because we can edit the result. We can uh, correct these unpleasing results, for example, by bringing back the correct appearance of the building or uh, drawing back the string that the woman is walking on. Another example for this use case is this uh, eyesight test chart, the Snellen chart. So we have it here uh, in low resolution and, and feeding it into ESRGAN is this result, which looks much better, but we know that these characters should look like the characters of the Latin alphabet. Uh, so in this case, once again, we can use our framework and for example, attempt to imprint the correct or the, uh, the uh, characters from the Latin alphabet and we would get a better looking output. And the last use case I'm going to uh, tell you about is the one I started with, which is pure exploration or creativity if you want. So if we have this low resolution input, we can use our framework to explore the, the diversity, the abundance of uh, possible high resolution images that correspond to it, that could, could have given rise to it, uh, while knowing that all of these outputs are perfectly consistent with the input. So, uh, how am I on time? Okay, so uh, let me conclude and I will tell you that I have one more slide after this because I want to tell you about the follow-up work that we just submitted. But uh, first I'll uh, conclude the talk. So I told you about uh, existing super resolution methods that only output a single solution which cannot be manipulated. And I uh, told you what I, why we think it's problematic. And then I described this uh, novel task that we propose of explorable super resolution. And I told you about the solution for this task uh, that comprises a super resolution model and an exploration graphical user interface. I told you I elaborated a bit more about this specific component called the consistency and forcing module uh, with some additional benefits that it has outside the context of explorable super resolution. And finally, uh, I demonstrated um, the benefits of using our framework uh, and uh, some exploration tools that we propose. Uh, our code is available on GitHub, so you can uh, uh, download it and play with the um, with a GUI and explore the different solutions by yourself, or you can train a super resolution, ex an explorable super resolution model uh, from scratch if you want. Um, yeah, and that's it. So now uh, let me spend one last slide, uh, slide to tell you about um, this follow-up work. So we think this, um, this method of explorable super resolution, this task of explorable super resolution should be a part or um, yeah, it should be a part of a bigger paradigm, which we call explorable computer vision, uh, which aims at enabling the exploration of the abundance of, of plausible and possible solutions to many different computer vision tasks. These can be uh, image restoration tasks like uh, dehazing or deblurring or many others. And in a follow-up work that we just submitted, we demonstrated it for the case of image decompression, which is a, a problem which has a lot of ambiguity in it. Uh, specifically, we demonstrated it for JPEG. So for example, if we have this uh, JPEG image, this compressed uh, image of a kitten here, and we want to zoom in to better see it, uh, then we can feed it to our uh, network, our decompression network. And we already get a result which looks better, so we're able to remove the artifacts. But then we can also answer questions like, what is this kitten looking at? Um, I mean, what, it looks very um, focused. So perhaps it is looking at some uh, fly that is hovering uh, in front of it, or perhaps it is looking at a worm that is hanged from this uh, thread in front of it. And similar to the case of uh, super resolution, here all outputs are guaranteed to match the uh, compressed JPEG file, meaning that if we compress them again, we would get back the exact same J JPEG file that we started with. This is the... Um, this is the idea of consistency in the context of JPEG. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, radical. One question here, Hi, Joel. Uh, 
Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, Hi, would you use this to, um, to, improve, to improve the compression, for instance? Like if you detect that there are some pieces of the image that uh, should be there or that there is high variance on what you predict as being possible mm -hmm. and still be real, could you modify the compression so that it puts more bits on regions where you know, there is higher variance? Yeah, so, so our method only um, changes or only, only applies to the second part of the compression, which is the decompression. So we take images which are already compressed. I think, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in modifying the compression or devising new compression techniques that would assign, like you said, the bits to the more important uh, information, you may say. Um, but anyway, if you have a lossy compression algorithm, you would always have some ambiguity. Sometimes it would be uh, insignificant or semantically insignificant, but I think it's difficult to predict it ahead when you devise a compression algorithm. Uh, um, unless maybe, maybe you refer to the case where you um, compress, like you, you compress the image per image. You look at the image and you decide how to compress it, how to assign the bits. Yeah which I think is a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, you could imagine in, in Photoshop, you know, when you compress, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, you have a slider that tells you how many bits mm -hmm. you want to have, but you really have no other way of input into the system. You know, okay, okay, okay. Now, yeah, now, you're now really doing purely here, or, you know, I don't know. Really I think I get what, that. Yeah, now, now I think I get what you're saying. You, you suggest that when you want to save the image, it would show you, for example, how it is going to look like, and then you can edit it, you can, assign the bits differently to, uh, to make the, um, you can explore the different assignment of uh, bits, for example, to have a better looking output. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, actually. Um, yeah. yeah, it's an exploration in the compression uh, stage. That's right, that's right. I have a question on like the imprinting where you talked about the license split. Mm -hmm. Is there like a structured way to determine like zero, one and like eight um or is that all like manual where you you look and like try to find it i'm curious like if there's a way to kind of like assign a number yeah. for these plausible outputs yeah it's a good question uh we thought about this a bit so uh, initially we thought about uh, trying to for example uh use a, a pre-trained uh, digit classification uh, network to apply it on the output of our network and try to maximize for example the output for each of the digits and stuff like that and see uh, which digit get the higher the highest score for example uh, this is something we can do we didn't do it uh, I, I'm afraid you would have issues of finding adversarial examples adversarial images that fool the image to think it is so but I think it's possible for example if you use something that limits the output to still look uh, like a true image to like a natural image something like that something like that so yeah I think it's an it's a certainly a possible direction we didn't do it though. Well, thanks. Sure. Hi, Paul. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, just to follow up on that, um, do you think about using like a patch prior or just an image probability model for that same purpose? So you can say, here's the reconstruction. What's how likely is this to be a natural image? Mm -hmm. So one of the tools. I hope I understand your question correctly. One of the tools that we have in this GUI is we can apply the discriminator used for training our network on uh, on an area of the image and try to uh, optimize over the space of control signals to um, to maximize the score of the discriminator so that it would think this is real um, so this is one thing I did I don't think it worked very well uh, so I think if I understand you correctly, you mean that I would just look at the score to say how how real it, how real it is, right? Look at the score of yeah. the discriminator, for example. Yeah, so something like that. Um, but maybe a discriminator is not the best probability model. Um, mm -hmm. So anything that's a model of P of X, where X is an image, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it could be an energy-based model or a VAE, mm -hmm. um, whatever the best one is out there. That will give you some score of the plausibility, for example, yeah. of, the, of the output. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, we, we didn't do it, but it's uh, certainly interesting. Cool, thanks. Hi, yeah, well, thanks for the 
interesting talk. Uh, I also have a question. Um, might be a little ambitious, but uh, would be interesting if uh, if we could do some sort of active learning here. Because I understand that by user manipulation or user edit, you want to add some prior to the pre-trained model. Um, so what if somehow this user input can, as a prior, can also uh, uh, be incorporated to the uh, further fine tuning the model. Although uh, and I said it might be a little ambitious, it means that probably you need a lot of user inputs, but uh, at any point that the user does something to the image, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a few more thousand iteration can be added to do a little change of the like back that's, propagation and change of the gradient. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So you're suggesting something like uh, if we have many users editing many images, so once the user is happy with the output, we can think of it as a, as a good output, as a plausible output, and add it to the training set of our image and of our uh, of our yeah, model. Something, yeah, because... Yeah. Something like that, like if as a either plausible output or as a good prior, mm -hmm. for instance, in, you see that in some cases, most of the times people prefer some vertical stripes to, I don't know, horizontal stripes. To diagonal, yeah. Mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I probably it needs more. Um, yeah, so, so perhaps you want to, for example, learn the preference, the, the general preference of user Right. I try to incorporate into the model training. Interesting. I agree it's ambitious, but it's certainly interesting. Thank you. If there are no more questions, thanks a lot, Duval, for, for the great talk. It was, it was Thank you very much. You. Thank and you. And, uh, yeah, and I'll be happy to, if anyone is interested in chatting, you can reach me by email. And thank you.